So good morning, everyone. And the, today is the Solemnity of the Assumption, Tuesday, August 15th. And we are going to um, be uh, discussing the next two Sunday readings. Um, readings for the next two Sundays, the 20th Sunday in Ordinary Time and the 21st Sunday. We know that um, in, during year A, all of the Sunday readings are from the Gospel of Matthew, and they are in a kind of a semi-continuous uh, selection so that one Sunday will be somewhere after the Sunday before and before the Sunday after. So that sometimes there's a gap, sometimes they're perfectly continuous. We'll see a little bit more about that in, in, uh, in a few minutes. So once again, welcome to everybody. And I thought it would be good for our prayer today to have a reflection from St. John of Damascus. Uh, I mentioned this actually in a homily that I gave two years ago here on this very day, uh, a homily on the, on the Assumption. And I concluded that homily with a uh, selection from a homily of St. John of Damascus in which he puts a little dialogue derived from scripture but into the mouth of Mary as she dies and commends herself to, to her son, body and soul, and uh, uh, then Jesus' own response to that. So I'd like to read this and just uh, uh, Follow along kind of in your own mind uh, these words of Mary and Jesus because this dialogue is also the dialogue that Jesus invites us to enter into, that Jesus invites us to, to um, respond to him as Mary has responded. And so she says, into your hands, my son, I commend my spirit. Receive this soul which is dear to you. What you have preserved free from sin, I hand over my body, not to the earth, but to you. Take me to yourself, so that where you are, the child of my womb, there, so there I also may be your companion. I am hastening to you, who have so often come to me on this side of that long distance. And then Jesus says, come to rest, my blessed mother. Arise, come, my beloved, most blessed of all, among all women. Behold, the winter is ended. You are all fair, my beloved, and there is no spot or stain found in you. The odor of your ointments is more precious than all other aromas. And so we continue under the patronage of Mary, of course, here at the house that is dedicated to the place where, in a sense, it all began, Nazareth House. And there's some uh, uh, discussion, uh, differences of opinion, as to where Mary actually died. In fact, there's some, you know, some minority opinion that says that she did not die, but was assumed without death. The, tra the, the greater tradition of the church seems to be that Mary did die, and then um, her tomb was discovered empty, uh, that, and then revealed that she had uh, been taken up bodily into heaven. So. Uh, we are, the, the part of the difference of, difference of opinion is, did this happen in Ephesus or in Jerusalem? I think, I think it's fair to say that the tradition is she spent a fair amount of her life in that little house in Ephesus uh, that is so often visited on pilgrimages. I've been there many times. And she, however, went to Jerusalem before her death and died where the Church of the Dormition is in Jerusalem, 
and from there she was assumed into heaven. Seems fitting that she would die and be uh, lifted up uh, in Jerusalem rather than in Ephesus. So now between last week and this week, you may remember last week had the event of Jesus walking on the water. Uh, that occurred after the feeding of the 5,000, the multiplication of loaves. Um, and in between that time, she, he went from uh, that area around Bethsaida to, um, to a place called Gennesaret, which is near Magdala. And uh, so you see where that blue arrow is, that's basically where the um, uh, walking on the water occurred and his rescue, shall we say, of Peter, the one of little faith. Um, we'll see that faith explored a little bit more in next week's reading, the following week's reading. But what is omitted is that there at Gennesareth, um, Jesus severely criticizes the, the Pharisees. Um, and calls them hypocrites. And then after that event, he goes north to the Canaanite region, which is where that red arrow is, is directing us. It's, it's a fairly long distance, probably took about um, two days walking fast or three days walking more or less normally to, uh, to go from, that, from the one point to the other. Uh, people did a lot of walking in those days, and I don't think they took leisurely strolls when they were actually traveling. I think that they uh, probably went at a pretty good clip, maybe at least three miles an hour, which is not impossible for walking and uh, can be, it's a pace that can be sustained throughout the course of the day. So, in other words, he walked from that distance. And then, what in this Canaanite region, we had the have the encounter that we will explore in a moment. But a question is, who were the Canaanites? Well, in Scripture, the Canaanites, Canaan, was a grandson of Noah, the son of Ham, and there's a genealogy in uh, the uh, sixth chapter. Of, uh, of, of Genesis, which it's a very interesting genealogy because what, what that genealogy does is from the perspective of the one writing the book of Genesis, which would have taken place several thousand years later uh, in probably the 6th, 7th century before Christ, uh, compiling ancient traditions. Well, the, the purpose of that genealogy was to try to establish where all of the peoples of the earth came from. And so they took these various sons of Noah and grandsons of Noah and had them to be the, the ancestors of all of the various peoples of the known world. Uh, the, the world that was known uh, uh, known to the Israelites at that time. And so Canaan plays a big role, uh, son of Ham, uh, son of Noah, uh, because uh, his descendants, and it names them, Canaan became the father of Sidon, his firstborn, and of Heth, also of the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, the Archites, the Sinites, the Arvadites, the Zemarites, and the Hamathites. So all of those people, according to Genesis, descended from Canaan, which were basically the whole variety of clans of people that spread uh, through what was the promised land, the, prom the land of promise that was overtaken by the Israelites fleeing from Egypt. And so they extended all the way from uh, Sidon in the north 
down to Gaza and over to Sodom and Gomorrah. Those were all the, the land of the Canaanites. One of the interesting things is what that means. It's, it's a generic reference for people who inhabited the area before the Israelites came. And this Canaanite woman probably refers not so much to ethnicity as it does to her alien status. What's emphasized is she was not of the Jewish people, not of the people of Israel. She was a foreigner. She was an alien. In other gospels, she's called the Syrophoenician woman because that territory up around Tyre and Sidon had been invaded and settled by the Phoenicians. And we've all heard of the Phoenicians in ancient history. They were also known as the Philistines, from which we get the name Palestine. And who was the big famous giant who was the Philistine? Uh, Goliath. So those were also, the word Phoenicia, the Phoenicians were the sea people. And they invaded probably from Carthage and came to settle in that area and, of course, caused a lot of disruption. So that area has always been rather disruptive, disrupted, perhaps disruptive too. <laughs> but uh, So this Canaanite woman basically is the symbol of all that is foreign, all that is alien to the Israelites. And so kind of those are the ears we need to uh, listen to this with. So who has the gospel for this coming Sunday? At Deacon that Sharp. time, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon, and behold, a Canaanite woman of that district came and called out, Have pity on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But Jesus did not say a word in answer to her. Jesus' disciples came and asked him, Send her away, for she keeps calling out, for she keeps calling out after us. Jesus said in reply, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Okay, one thing that's kind of uh, helpful, I think, to uh, see in the background is the context of what happened before this event. Because many commentators will say that um, the uh, feeding of the 5,000, uh, that these events taking place following that feeding of the 5,000, uh, that they are events that somewhat uh, serve to interpret the, uh, the meaning of the feeding of the 5,000. Certainly, uh, commentators have traditionally said that Jesus walking on water immediately after that miracle of multiplication of loaves shows not only his uh, power over the natural elements, but also his intention to save, and to save uh, even those of weak faith, those of little faith, like, like Peter. But then he condemns the narrowness. This is, this is in between last week and this week. Jesus condemns the narrowness of the Pharisaic practices, particularly their insistence that washing your hands is more important than eating wasn't because of hygiene nearly so much as it was just a ritual practice to kind of ensure the meticulous legalistic um, observance of the law. And, and Jesus says that, you know, that is uh, narrowness. That is, that, that's not, uh, not God's intention. Now, one interpretation, which I, th I found quite interesting, you know the 12 baskets left over after that, okay, that is certainly a sign of abundance. But some commentators and the early fathers have said that the, uh, 
the 12 baskets was food that was refused by the Pharisees who were in that audience because they felt that it was unclean because nobody had washed their hands. And so that Jesus provided enough for everybody and some refused that gift and that is why the uh, why the uh, 12 baskets was left over. And that's an interesting interpretation and I think uh, perhaps it's it's it, it, it bears some thinking about. Now, because what Jesus does immediately after that is share the bread of God's word with one who is the most alien type of person possible from, uh, from, the, from the Jews, from the Israelites. And uh, that's up there, this particular incident. And the, the, the dialogue here is kind of interesting because this woman, we don't know what, we don't know how old the daughter is, we don't know what the, the actual nature of that torment is, but this Canaanite woman comes to him and, and Jesus at first seems to be adopting the stance of the Pharisees. Uh, in fact, he even... Uh, we'll see that he even uses the metaphor of bread, of food. But he says, you know, first, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, she has her own way of saying, oh yeah? <laughs> and confronting Jesus with that. So, continue, please. But the woman came and did the Lord, help me. He did reply, It is not a right to take the food of the children and throw it to the dogs. She said, Please, Lord, but even the dogs eat the scraps that fall off from the table of their master. Then Jesus said to her in reply, O oh, woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. Let, and the woman, now notice how beautifully this passage is put together in this incident because Jesus is taking the high patriarchal authoritarian ground and with a simple affirmation of what he said. You know, she doesn't enter into an argument. She just takes what he said and turns it the other way around. And she comes out on the high ground, not Jesus. Uh, you might say that, you know, it's, it's a heresy to say that Jesus, in his human nature, knew everything, because that would make him not human. Jesus, in his human nature, had to grow in wisdom and age and grace before God and man, as uh, St. Luke's Gospel says. He had to learn. And we might perhaps be able to see this presented to us as a stage in Jesus' own learning experience and discovering that by faith one becomes a child of Israel. And that, of course, is a theme that's developed by Paul, as we'll see, especially in the letter to the Romans uh, later on. So she even came to him uh, in the previous slide. Yeah, a pagan comes to him and calls him the son of David, acknowledging him as the Messiah. And so, uh, as one commentator said, by faith she became what she was not by ancestral heritage. Here is a very interesting picture. It's not the one that I had on the... On the uh, flyer, but of this event, because I like it because the the dog features uh, in it, and you know, it just depicts her assertively taking the upper hand by pointing even to the dog, and Jesus, who is it's clear who Jesus is, 
and it's clear even the, the attitude of those who are surrounding him, but it's almost like he is taken aback by her and has to say, yes, you're right, and uh, thereby opens up the, the power of God for her. Uh, so let's move on from that event to uh, the first reading for this coming Sunday, which is from Isaiah. And uh, as so often happens, the first reading itself is a prequel, if you will, to the gospel reading. And so in the light of the gospel, we look back and see what Isaiah has to say. Thus says the Lord, observe what is right, do what is just, for my salvation is about to come, my justice about to be revealed. Now you'll notice that this, that verse is the first verse of 56, Isaiah 56. We've seen before that Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, is divided into three parts. The first part, which is 1 to 39, is uh, what's called the, it, it's the original Isaiah. It was written during the time of uh, the kings and warning, warning that uh, by entering into all these foreign alliances, that the people were going to be destroyed just like the people of Israel had been destroyed a hundred or more years before by the Assyrians, so too the people of Judah were going to be invaded by the Babylonians and led into captivity. The second part from Isaiah 40 to 55 uh, recounts basically the time right at the invasion and the beginning of the captivity and is uh, written they say, from the captivity in Babylon. And then this set last part, 56 to the end, is, is uh, uh, what's sometimes called the Book of Consolation. And that was written after the time of the return from Babylon. And it's the book that encourages the Jewish people to reestablish themselves, reestablish their, their uh, homeland and heritage, rebuild the temple in Jerusalem, and become the people that God intends them to be. But the people that God intends them to be is not a self-glorifying, oh, look at me, I'm special because God loves me. The people that God intends the people of Israel to be is a people with a mission. And that mission is not to wall themselves off from the rest of the world, not to separate themselves, even in their attitude, from the rest of the world, but to uh, uh, have a mission of salvation to the rest of the world. So that's how the rest of this uh, uh, reading continues. The foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, ministering to him, loving the name of the Lord, and becoming his servants, all who keep the Sabbath free from profanation and hold to my covenant, them I will bring to my holy mountain and make joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar, and my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Sadly, the Jewish people have a history of not doing that, but because what they, what they sought to do was make converts to their way rather than to bring their way as gift to others. Sadly, I think all too often, we have had the same attitude, that we, we use our specialness as people graced by God as a means of converting rather than serving. Now, what that means, of course, is, yes, people have to look at our way of 
worshiping, our way of serving God and serving them as attractive and be brought within the sphere of Christ's disciples. But uh, we do that not by saying, I've got the truth and I need to teach you the truth, but I am your servant and I'm serving you in the name of God. And, and we need to try to do that in a way that is drawing welcoming and attractive to others. So it's not a sort of a watered-down ecumenism nearly so much as it is living your faith, living your keeping to the covenant in a way that becomes in itself a call to people of goodwill, to people who uh, are, are seeking, then they can find the discipleship, the, the way of Christ uh, here among us. Now we go into the second reading, which is St. Paul's letter to the Romans, which we have been uh, discussing for the last month or two, ever since the end of uh, the end of the uh, Easter season. And it's interesting that here in, in Romans, Paul is most pointedly reflecting about just what his his own mission has been in relation to Israel, and that is to fulfill what Jesus uh, was saying, what Isaiah was saying and what Jesus was doing, let's put it that way, uh, to uh, bring the covenant of God into the sphere of those who are not originally part of the covenant, and to um, enable them to become children also of the promise, not by physical generation, not, not uh, physically, but by uh, union with Christ. So who has the second? No. Brothers and sisters, I am speaking to you Gentiles. Inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles, I glory in my ministry in order to make my race jealous and thus save some of them. For if their rejection is a reconciliation of the world, what will be their acceptance be but life from the dead? Now, throughout the letter to the Romans, we need a little word of uh, about the makeup of the Roman Christian community at the time of St. Paul. We don't know who evangelized the Roman Christians because it certainly was not Peter uh, he was not there yet um, when, when Christianity came, when, when the way of Christ came. He came later and, and you know, was certainly seen as the head of the apostles and became the head of the church. But uh, the Roman Christians were largely Jewish. Uh, they were evangelized. I think, by um, apostles who were Jewish, who came, uh, maybe not among, maybe, maybe not one of the twelve, probably not, but they, they were part of what would have been considered by Paul the Judaizers. You know, a Jewish community who accepts the way of Christ, becomes a disciple of Christ, will see that as a very natural fulfillment of what it means to them to be Jewish. And their natural instinct would be, if somebody wants to, be, wants to follow Christ, they have to become Jewish first. That's their natural instinct. And so uh, that's probably what most of the, of the Jewish Christians at Rome, the way that they felt about it. That's one reason why they viewed Paul with suspicion, because he was running around telling people, that you don't have to be Jewish, you don't have to become Jewish, you don't have to accept circumcision as a sign of the covenant, you don't have to accept all the dietary laws, all the customs and, um, and practices of the Jews in order to become a disciple of Christ. To us, that's no-brainer, that's obvious. But it wasn't to the Jewish Christians of that time. So Paul had a very difficult time uh, ingratiating himself, becoming accepted by the Jewish Christians wherever they were, 
because they looked at him with suspicion. They were violating the traditions. He was violating the traditions of their ancestors, and they opposed him. Now, Paul had a very strong reason why he had to come to Rome, because he wanted to use, we don't know if this actually happened or not. There's no, no record of his succeeding in doing this. There is record that he intended to do this. He wanted to use Rome as a launching platform for his mission to Spain. Uh, at the time he was coming to Rome for this, or writing this letter, uh, the word of Christ had, had spread to the entire Mediterranean basin except that area west of Italy, uh, the south coast of France and the and the uh, and Spain. So, at least as far as Paul knew, there are other traditions that say even Mary Magdalene and Lazarus and Martha got to France and James went to um, Spain. Maybe, maybe not. I I personally think those those traditions are spurious, but. Uh, uh, if they did do that, uh, Paul probably didn't know about it. He was, uh, but he was gung ho to go to Spain. But he needed the support of the Romans, so that's why he had to defend himself to the Romans. And that's why, in the Romans, we have probably the clearest articulation of his um, of his theology, of the way that he thought about how Jesus saves humanity. Uh, and so up to this point, up to chapter 11, verse 13, Paul is speaking primarily to the Jewish community, the Jewish Christian community in Rome. And now he's speaking to those who are Gentiles, who may have joined that Christian community, maybe uh, going through the whole ritual of being initiated as a Jew before being baptized? Maybe not. Maybe some of them were, you know, there were a lot of what they called God-fearers, uh, kind of hangers-on the, to, the, uh, uh, to the synagogues. And uh, Paul sent, tended to go after them. They were pagans who weren't prepared to take the whole Jewish step. And Paul's message was good news for them but it was bad news for the Jewish community. Why? Because these God-fearers were some of the wealthiest supporters of the Jewish community. And, wealthy, and, and there's records of those. You know, there's inscriptions, donor walls, and that, of, of obviously people with pagan names being recognized as big donors to the, to the synagogues. And uh, so uh, there was a certain threat if Paul was taking them away from the synagogue, you didn't have to be Jewish to be Christian. Well, he's also taking away people who were big supporters. I don't know if that kind of thing ever happens today or not. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, that's one of the things that's behind all of this that, that I, I find kind of interesting. So now he's speaking to the Gentiles, and he's reflecting with them on, you know, your Jewish brothers and sisters, for the most part, and there were you know, undoubtedly many Jews in Rome who were not disciples of Jesus, who were not following the way of Jesus, they, and, and were probably opposed to the ones who were. And he's saying you know, to the Gentiles, look at what's happening around you. Many have accepted, many more have rejected, but their rejection is your grace so that the word of God through Jesus may come to you. So let's move on to the next section. For the gifts and the call of God are irrevocable. Just as you once disobeyed God, but have now received mercy because of their disobedience, so they have now disobeyed in order that by virtue of the mercy shown to you, they too may now receive mercy. For God delivered all to disobedience, that he might have mercy upon all. So here's Paul's hope in speaking to the Gentiles now, that 
the Jews might see that they are receiving they are receiving and living according to the promise even if they haven't been outwardly signed with the sign of the covenant that in Jesus they are now partaking of the covenant and his hope is that those who have refused to acknowledge Jesus would see a miracle happening here and would come to know and come to acknowledge Jesus. And that's a hope that does not yet seem to have been fulfilled. So uh, we will kind of just leave it at that and go on to the next Sunday. So what happens between the uh, uh, the gospel of next week and the gospel of the following week. Well, the church skips Matthew 15, 29 to 16, 12. What happens there? Jesus goes back to the Sea of Galilee. And there is another feeding. Matthew is the only gospel that has two feedings, two uh, uh, multiplications of loaves. The other three gospels have just the one that seems to be the, the 5,000. This is another one of the 4,000. Uh, what's behind that? Was it sort of a retelling of the same event, or was it a distinct event? Uh, Matthew certainly seems to see it as a distinct event, but kind of framing, uh, framing this mission, this beginning of a mission to the Gentiles up there in uh, Tyre and Sidon. So after that, Jesus warns of the leaven of the Pharisees. And he, he warns that you know, the, the, the Pharisees, in their rigidity, in their strictness, are replacing the law, or rather replacing God, the covenant, with the outward observance of the law. In other words, what they're saying is uh, the, outer, the, the outward actions is more important than the inner direction of your heart. And he's saying, you know, beware of that. That's the leaven of the Pharisees. And then from there, it takes a two-day journey with its disciples up to Caesarea Philippi. And that's when what happens here. Who has the gospel here? Jesus went into the region of Caesarea Philippi. <clears throat> and he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter said in reply, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, we hear this phrase, Son of the living God, as a declaration of faith in Jesus' divinity. And I think we're hearing that rightly. But throughout the Old Testament, various people and angels have been called the Son or the Sons of God. So to Jesus' hearers, or to Peter's hearers, that phrase does not necessarily indicate divinity. It's kind of our, our reflection afterwards that sees this as a sign of of, of Jesus' uh, divinity. So uh, this, this beginning of the dialogue is that you know Jesus is trying to bring his disciples from the kind of the ordinary faith. Here we've got somebody special into an affirmation that yes, you are the one who is to come. You are the Son of God. You are manifesting God's presence in a specific and unique way. So let's continue with Jesus' response. Jesus said to him in reply, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my heavenly Father. And so I say to you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of the netherworld and not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. 
Whatever you find in earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose in earth shall be loosed in heaven. And he strictly ordered his disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Okay. Matthew is the only one who elaborates this commissioning of Peter. And in a sense, this is a parallel for Peter's relationship among the disciples to the Great Commission after his resurrection of go forth and make disciples of all nations, the relationship of the apostles to all nations, to the rest of the world. And so, at very least, uh, Jesus is basically singling Peter out for a particular relationship among the disciples, that he is going to be the center, the rock. Now, what's interesting is everywhere Peter is recorded, he is anything but a rock, except when he's trying to walk on water, then he sinks like a rock. But uh, So, I. I I think the first lesson for us is he probably chose what would seem to be the most unlikely one to be the one who would be the focal point, the centerpiece, the one on whom the others would depend just like a building depends on its foundation stone. And of course there is a bit of a play of words here, his name, Simon, son of Jonah. Jonah was a fairly common uh, Jewish name. And he changes the name to, uh, in Aramaic, it's Kepha. In Greek, it's Kephas. Also, uh, that's, a, that's not the Greek word, that's the Greek version of the Aramaic word. But in, in Greek, it's Petros. Petrus in, uh, in uh, Latin which means rock. Now, the interesting thing is Paul refers to Peter as Kephas. Now, I don't know why they insist on spelling it with a C in in English, because it is not pronounced with a soft C anywhere in in the tradition of the language. So that word is not Cephas, it's Kephas. So anybody here who is a, um, is a lector, just be aware that when you are reading those sections in the church, if you say Cephas instead of Kephas, the ground will open up under you and you will be swallowed up. Uh, it, it really needs to be pronounced correctly with, with a hard C. Even if, and I have to say, some of the, some of the booklets that tell you how to pronounce do it wrong, but they're wrong. I have spoken. <laughs> anyway, the other thing that may be worth looking at here is on this rock I will build my church. Now, later on, what we've tended to hear there is the Roman Catholic institutional church. And I'm not going to deny that. Uh, God forbid. But, uh, but, you know, the word from which we get church in Hebrew is kahal, and in Greek it's ekklesia. Ekklesia and kahal mean the same thing. They are a gathering of people, a coming together of people, people who are called together as a community for a purpose. That is a kahal. So the better translation of church really is assembly people who are assembled together. So the people who gather in my name will be founded upon you. And so uh, we then derive from that, uh, legitimately I think, the whole relationship of the successor of Peter as the Bishop of Rome and, uh, and his relationship to the universal church. I think that is correct, but that is derived from uh, Peter being at the center of the community of apostles, and therefore his role is continued by his successor, just like the bishops are continue, continuation of the apostles. Now, 
that having been said, how about the keys of the kingdom? The keys were always a servant's role, not a master's role. You know, there is an old story that you can tell where you are in a, in a hierarchy of a corporation by the number of keys <laughs> that you have. The CEO needs only one key to the executive bathroom. The janitor needs all the keys to everywhere. So the key bearer, as we'll see in the next reading, is, is the one that has, and I think this is, is key, more responsibility than authority. The authority of the one with the keys is a reflected authority uh, from the, the, the one who is the sovereign. It is not his own authority. But his responsibility is to serve the authority of the one who has authority. So that, we, we need to you know, look at that in terms of, let's say, the definition of infallibility. The infallibility of the Pope, as defined by Pope Pius IX back in, what, 1860, was really uh, an act of service to maintain the unity of faith of the Church, not simply an act of the authority that I am going to uh, I've, I alone have the power to proclaim God's word authentically. Well, if you have the power to proclaim God's word authentically, it is at the service of the hearers. It's not a prerogative that you personally, uh, personally have. So the definition of papal infallibility has always been seen and has to be seen as an act of service in relation to the faith and the unity and the integrity of God's people. So, uh, that having been said, let's move on to Isaiah, because we'll get a little bit more about this key stuff here in, in this uh, Isaiah. Thus says the Lord to Shinjah, master of the palace, I will trust you from your office and pull you down from your station. On that day, I will summon my servant, Eliakim, son of Hilkiah. I will clothe him with your robe and gird him with your sash and give, him, and give over to him your authority. Okay. Now, basically, the Lord is saying to Shebna, you're fired. Mm -hmm. uh, why? Well, Shebna was master of the palace. Master of the palace means he was a finance minister. And his behavior was that he acted like a master rather than a servant. He was a servant to the king. But he did things uh, that were detrimental to the, uh, to, to the kingdom. He did them in his own name under his own authority, and the Lord says, uh, basically, you're fired. In fact, there's one translation, the message translation, that, that is, it's just juicy. He, he says to uh, Isaiah, God says to Isaiah, go to the steward, Shebna, who's in charge of the king's affairs, and tell him, what's going on here? You're an outsider here, and yet you act like you own the place. Make a big fancy tomb for yourself where everyone can see it, making sure everyone will think you're important. God is about to sack you, throw you to the dogs. He'll grab you, I love this, he'll grab you by the hair and swing you round and round dizzyingly and then let you go, sailing through the air like a ball until you're out of sight. Where you land, nobody knows. And there you'll die. And all the stuff you've collected and heaped on your grave. You've disgraced your master's house. You're fired and good riddance. Now, that puts a little bit of uh, 
uh, how would you say, a little bit of life into our usually very staid and proper translations. So, poor Shebna. Now, so how about the promise on Eliakim, who's going to replace Shebna? Please. He, sh he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. I will place the key of the house of David on Eliakim's shoulder. When he opens, no one shall shut. When he shuts, no one shall open. I will fix him like a peg in a sure spot to be a place of honor for his family. So, he wants a true servant, Eliakim. And he, you know, he's got the keys, the key to the house of David, and he will have the power to open and shut because he will be a faithful servant to the house of David, to the kingdom. That chapter of Isaiah actually has 25 verses. After this promise, verse 25 says, that peg fixed in a firm place shall give way, break off, and fall, and the weight that hung on it shall be done away with. The Lord has spoken. In other words, poor Eliakim after, uh, or Eliakim after uh, being put in that position with all kinds of hope and promise. He doesn't do so well either, and he gets cut off. Now, one last thing. There is another Eliakim, or Eliakim, in the genealogy of Jesus, if you've read in both Matthew and Luke. But that one is a different person with the same name. He comes later, a couple of hundred years later, actually. Okay, finally, the second reading. Short. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How inscrutable are his judgments and how unsearchable his ways. Or who has shown the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has given the Lord anything that he may be? For from him and to him and for him are all things. To him the glory forever. Amen. So Paul is still speaking to the uh, Gentiles, as we saw in the previous reading. Uh, but he is using, here he's using the language, especially of the Psalms. Uh, to this, and, and the wisdom literature, to, to describe basically the fact that, you know, it doesn't really make sense for God to do this, to make his chosen people the servants of the Gentiles. But God's wisdom is not our wisdom. The bottom line is it's a mystery. We cannot really probe the depths of the mind of God. All that we can do is embrace the mystery. So, well, that's kind of the bottom line of what we are called to do as believers, to embrace the mystery of God, God's love and compassion for us and for all people. And so, thank you. God bless you all. Thank you.